Welcome to the Tuesday Nighters, more specifically to the weekly book club, all of it falling under the, the name The Church of Jesus Christ. I say that especially uh, with some emphasis tonight, given our the chapter we're going into, this the third, uh, the excuse me, the 27th chapter of Third Nephi, which takes takes into account the naming of the Church of Jesus Christ. So in week 40, uh, much like we did last week, we're calling this, Is His Gospel? This, this always kind of, the phrase gospel always kind of uh, reminds me of um, the thought around Judaism or Jewish people or Jews. Is it a religion? Is it a people? Is it a, is it a spot on the map? What exactly are we talking about? And so when we think of Israel, what what is it defining? Uh, same with gospel. Is his gospel a message? Is it an organization or a people? Or is it both? And this is part two of that because we started this last week. So given um, uh, last week's uh, 39th chapter, we only ended up doing one chapter last week. We didn't do the, the assigned two. Um, we probably did one point. 1.2, 1.1 of last week. We touched a little bit on 27, at least in my introduction we did. So we're going to we're gonna jump into 27 with both feet. Um, so far we've done 217 chapters, 5,300 plus words, 145,000 uh, words, excuse me. Um, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I thought I was behind, my bad. Okay, doing this again. Given the 39th week, uh, we only did the 26th chapter, which was just one chapter, 21 verses, 793 words, and celebrate. That was our shortest assignment ever. I know you read more, but we only talked about one. And so we're finding your conversations are getting richer. We're finding you're, you're squeezing out more, more gems than we ever have before because we have a more targeted focus on a weekly basis. And I am thoroughly enjoying that about our assignment. So again, 218, 5,300 plus verses, 146,000 plus words, and 69 hours of discussion. Let's get into it. So 3rd Nephi, the 27th chapter, is one chapter, 33 verses, 1,287 words. Any other time before last week, this probably would have been the shortest uh, assignment yet. Let's start this way. William Shakespeare provided Juliet with the following Whoa. words that she said to Romeo. A rose is a rose is a rose. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Shakespeare was theorizing that words and names don't necessarily define the object, don't necessarily define the subject. They're just words. His theory would be if you call a baseball a Volkswagen, it's not going to change the tra trajectory or the speed of the, of the pitch. And it's certainly not going to hinder the hitter from hitting the ball. However, all rules have some exceptions. Example. Some of you might carry a name that means something to your family. It might be your father's name, your forefather's name, someone in your past, your mother's name, or, or again, further into your families, you carry that name. And those types of monikers are significant. They give you some type of obligation to serve and honor that individual. They might even give you some type of cause or purpose. So for some, such names might demand that kind of respect. And they might even affect your behavior when you carry that name. That's what tonight's class is about. It's not about a rose at all, but instead the importance of a significant name. And that name that we're speaking of tonight in the 27th chapter, Jesus the Christ. Just consider for a moment that you present something of your own doing and those who receive it, those who embrace it are tempted to credit another. I just wanted to give you a little example. Real quickly, who invented the automobile? If your mind went to Henry Ford, you might be surprised by the next chapter, or excuse me, the next paragraph. The first automobile actually can be traced back to Nicholas Cugn, I'm going to say cugnot because I want to say a, a word that sounds like a, a curse word in Spanish. So I'll say 
Kuno, but I know I'm still not pronouncing it right, but that's as close as I want to get to pronouncing it properly because I may cross over to a, a, a bad word. Okay, but back in 1769, he built a steam-powered tricycle used to haul artillery for the French military. Okay, because it was steam-powered, for many, they nullified that invention as an automobile, as a vehicle, because it was steam, not gas. However, even before Henry Ford, two Germans, Carl Frederick Benz and Gottlieb Daimler, worked entirely separately, two different parts of, of Germany, and developed individually their own gasoline-powered automobiles. Both of them introducing them in 1876, two different cities. However, Benz had driven his three-wheel vehicle successfully in 1885, and that's the one most consider was the first commercially available car in history. It wasn't Henry Ford. Henry Ford is remembered in the auto in industry for making the Model T, which was mass produced through an assembly line. Those of you in Detroit sit a little taller. I know you're very proud of, of this history, which made automobiles available to middle class Americans. So given that fact, he's the one who's often credited with inventing the car. You see, Sometimes the presentation and the introduction of something can be hijacked. So if Jesus introduced, if Jesus presented by example, if Jesus authorized his gospel through his spirit, then why wouldn't it carry his name? Jesus had fulfilled to this point. He had fulfilled the law of Moses, both in the old country and here in the Americas, through his own law of forgiveness and redemption. I always love the story that the, of the adulterous woman as interpreted for me. Maybe you heard it through it, someone else, this example. I heard it through Brother Dennis Morocco, who preached a sermon of, of the, the adulterous woman. And the, the point where Jesus um, crouches down and writes in the sand with his finger Brother Dennis takes us back to the law of Moses with his comments. And he said, the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablet rewrote the law of forgiveness in the sand. So he, he, he fulfilled the law of Moses as promised, not destroyed it, fulfilled it methodically and strategically. He didn't do it to shift the religious world philosophically. He did it to shift Judaism to reach for its intended purpose, which was a foundation to what his message was through this newly formed organization. It wasn't just a philosophy. It was the fullness of his gospel. So after formalizing the church, the leaders, we find the leaders in this 27th chapter in a quandary. What to call this newly formed institution? They sought answers uh, as their Savior had modeled in his own approach. They sought their answers methodically and strategically. And the way it, it's written in the first verse of the 27th chapter says this, the disciples were gathered together and were united in mighty prayer and fasting. And there's a little thing here that happens that if you all want to dissect with me, we'll do this later. I just found this, these first two or three verses powerful powerful as it pertains specifically to fasting and praying. Jesus responded by the, because they were united in mighty fasting and prayer, they were Jesus responded, he came to them as they were praying and he asked them, "What will ye that I shall give unto you?" And they answered him, "The name whereby we shall call this church." There was a little bit of dissension. There was a little confusion. So they were going to go to the source because they realized how critical this name was. So he answered and said, his name must be attached, but, but only if the church aligned with his purpose, aligned with his calling, aligned with his source himself. I find um, a Powerful couple of verses strung together. I read this to you last week, but as we jump back into the, the 27th chapter, I wanted to rewrite them again for you. So this is the gospel 
that Jesus referenced. This is where we're focused tonight. And he said it this way, Behold, I have given unto you, he's reflecting on the past year of his coming and going with them. Behold, I have given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel which I've given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my Father, because my Father sent me. My Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. He's giving you his purpose in one sentence. My father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. And after that I had been lifted up upon that cross, that I might draw all men unto me, that as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the father. What beautiful poetry. To stand before me, to be judged of their works, whether they be good or they be evil. For this cause have I been lifted up. Therefore, according to the power of the Father, I will draw all men unto me, that they may be judged according to their works. Quick overview of the rest of the chapter, or at least the pieces that I didn't touch with those, those verses. Jesus provides some of the last recorded counsel while in the Americas in this 27th chapter. He revisits repent, repenting and baptizing. As a first step toward salvation, him will I hold guiltless. That individual who repents and is baptized, him will I hold guilt, guiltless, says the 16th verse. He addressed his cleanliness in us. Those who have washed their garments in my blood, verse 19. He spoke of the power of his infusion, his spirit, sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, the 20th verse. He verified his truth. This is my gospel. And you know the things you must do in my church. 21st verse. He confirmed who the author is of the word of God. All things are written by the Father in the 26th verse. He gave him, he gave them an overview as he's signing off, if you will. He gave them an overview of the success from his visit over the past year. Those who had come in, those who were repented, those who were baptized, none of them are lost. And in them, I have fullness of joy. Remember where we started when we started reading right after the Sermon on the Mount. It said he groaned within himself because of the condition of Israel. Now he's saying those here in the Americas who had embraced the church embrace the gospel, embrace the message. In them, I have fullness of joy. That's what he says about each one of you. I want you to understand that because of you, he has fullness of joy. You know, when you look over this earth, there's great disappointment. I'm certain of that. But he finds those sparkles he finds those individuals that he has embraced and they have embraced him back. And it's you. None of them are lost. And in them, I have fullness of joy. And then lastly, around the 33rd verse, I think it is the 33rd. He really was saying goodbye. He bade them farewell and, say, and promised that the next words that they might hear from him are enter ye in at the straight gate. So let's talk tonight about the gospel of Jesus Christ. 